take a moment to introduce today's speaker, Roslyn Hackett, because um, uh, I know once you've got your lunch, you want to hear her, not, not me. Um, and before I, uh, I'm Ann Browdy, the director of the Women's Studies in Religion program. And this is our last uh, talk from our research associates for this term, but I do want to invite you all next semester. I know nobody's thinking about February yet, um, but on February 26, we look forward to a lecture by Alison Moore, who will be talking about identity and agency in houses of religious women in the late Middle Ages. A little different from today, but religion and gender go everywhere, so um, we, we do too. Um, and we also have a sign-up sheet there at the front for anyone who's not on our mailing list but would like to be notified of women's studies and religion lectures uh, throughout the year. And um, thank you, Tracy, for um, this wonderful Ethiopian lunch, which I'm sure you're enjoying. Um, so I have to start early with Rosalind's introduction because she's got a long CV, only a few highlights of which I'm going to mention um, today. We're really thrilled to have such a distinguished scholar with us this year in the Women's Studies in Religion program. Um, um, Rosalind has published widely on religion in Africa. Um, notably on new religious movements, religious media, gender and religion, regulation of religious diversity and religion and conflict. Um, these publications followed, of course, her, her PhD in religious studies from Aberdeen, and then eight years of teaching in Nigeria, which uh, began this rich engagement that have produced so many wonderful publications. Um, Rosalind's also very active in leadership in the profession at, uh, as chair of the Religious Studies Department at her home university of Tennessee in Knoxville, um, but also internationally. And I did want to mention um, she serves as president of the International Association of the History of Religions, um, and she has most recently been elected as Vice President of the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences, which is the UNESCO agency that is charged to report on the state of the humanities, including religious studies. So um, that's a, a very important position that we're, we're delighted to have her in. So I think without further ado, I'm going to um, pass, pass the microphone to Rosalind Hackett. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, to the uh, Carriage House team, uh, Anne and Tracy, who make it all happen, and my wonderful colleagues uh, for all their great suggestions and support regarding this project. And, my gratitude also goes to Bob DeVoe for his invaluable technical help and to my wonderful research assistant, Anne-Marie Mal. I also want to thank CSWR for hosting today and to all of you for being here. Now let's, let's start with a sound. Um, to get us in the mood. I'm going to comment on this below. Now, it's relatively easy to summarize my research project. My principal goal is to promote more sonically aware studies of religion, gender, and women. And by extension, studies of sound that would be more inclusive of gendered and religious subject matter. 
I have little trouble justifying my research agenda given the patent neglect of the acoustic and auditory domains in research on women, gender, and religion to, uh, to date. Most people are aware of the limitations placed on women's sounding and hearing practices, whether drumming or chanting, for example, in a range of religious settings. But it is not just about taboos, but also about the sounds of women, such as their wailing or singing, and how those may be privileged in certain ritual contexts, as at funerals. It is also about how women may assert their agency <coughs> by reclaiming ancient matriarchal sounds, as with overtone chanting or remixed vocals and instrumentals. There is plenty of evidence of this in the pagan, Wiccan and New Age traditions, for example. You just heard an English sound healer renowned for overtone chanting. Was it a male or a female voice? We have a vote for male. Vote for female. Was a female. Her name is Jill Purse. <laughs> For our time together today, I plan to do the following. Talk briefly about the status of the project and its origins. Situate this project in terms of broader scholarly developments and innovations in audio and media technologies. Outline the project's objectives, conceptual framing, scope and methodology. Discuss and listen to some examples that can demonstrate my research questions and outcomes, and five, provide a closing summary of what greater engagement with the field of sound might bring to studies of gender, women, and religion. Section one. People often ask me how I got interested in this topic. I answer as follows. I'm not a musician, but I work with jazz, mainly free jazz musicians in the US, France, Uganda and South Africa. I did not do field research on sound, but studied re religious landscapes in a part of Africa, southeastern Nigeria, where percussive sound prevailed, notably in relation to kingship and secret societies. I'm not trained in acoustic theory, but have plenty of experience dealing with ear doctors as I have unusual ears. I am not an artist or a composer, but I love making creative contributions to scholarship in my field of religious studies. Finally, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, home not only of the Vols, but also of the Big Ears Festival, famed for its celebration of avant-garde cross-genre music. All this has brought me to a magnum opus book project entitled Sound In As Religion. And I'm here this year to focus on the much needed gendered aspects of this work with particular attention to women. So in addition to moving along the writing process in this resource rich environment, I'm also keen to open up a space for more dialogue and research about both the neglect and potential of sound in relation to studies of gender, women, and religion. On that note, I have high expectations for the course I should be teaching next semester on sound, gender, and the study of religion. I wonder, do I have any takers in the audience? <laughs> no, I know that there was some good, 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 that's wonderful. <laughs> two, maybe more by the end. Um, <laughs> section two. Situate this project, I want, I'm situating the project now in the broader scholarly developments. Of one thing I am sure, this project is timely. Its broader context is the multi-sensory and material turns in the human sciences. More specifically, it is inspired by the rapid rise in inter- and multidisciplinary studies of the phenomenon of sound over the last two or more decades. Just a small sampling there. Incidentally, last year, the topic of the Sawyer Seminar at Harvard was on hearing modernity. I don't doubt that some people here who participated in that could tell us more. Now, the technological innovations of the 21st century form the backdrop and impetus to these scholarly trends, notably in relation to media and audio technologies. 
In the words of ethnomusicologist Veit Elman, quote, our ears are equipped as never before. Section three. In terms of objectives for my project, let me emphasize at the outset that I'm not trying to provide a gendered soundtrack of the world's religions, nor an account of the great musical women of religious history. That might be needed, but I'm much more interested in working with the broader concept of sound that includes musical sounds as my centerpiece. This allows me to move beyond liturgical contexts to a range of public, environmental, and private spaces. The latter may be more important if one is focusing on the sonic or listening practices of women. Studying sound leads one away from the confines of formal musical notation and musicological analysis, compelling attention to noise and silence, which again may be significant for research on women and religion. Sound and hearing also matter more in different historical periods, as argued by Lee Schmidt, Mark M. Smith, and Richard Rath in their influ influential studies of early American history. As an anthropologically inclined historian of religion, I'm also very cognizant of the fact that the concept of music does not exist in many cultures, and that, as anthropologist Stephen Felt demonstrated from his research on New Guinea forest peoples, audition rather than vision may be the primary sense in everyday perception and communication. Now, conceptual framing. The field of sound studies is replete with conceptual debate. For my purposes, I find historian and theorist of the media arts and, and experimental music, Douglas Kahn's definition to be productively comprehensive. And I put it up because it's quite substantial. By sound, I mean sounds, voice, and orality. All that might fall within or touch on auditive phenomena, whether this involves actual sonic or auditive events or ideas about sound or listening. Sounds actually heard or heard in myth, idea, or implication. Sounds heard by everyone or imagined by one person alone. Or sounds as they fuse with the sensorium as a whole. Along similar lines, historian Richard Rath's concept of sound ways or the paths, trajectories, mediations, practices, and techniques, in short, the ways that people employ to interpret and express their attitudes and beliefs about sound. So substitute people for women. Um, so here's this second quote also, I believe, invites research on the imbrications of sound in religious and cultural life. I also take inspiration from the Dutch musician and philosopher of sound and music, Marcel Corbusin's goal to detach spirituality from concepts of otherworldliness and transcendentalism in his 2008 work, Thresholds, Rethinking Spirituality Through Music. That'll be one of our textbooks. His grounded, his more grounded and non-dichotomous approach to the spiritual and the material is germane to rethinking more sounded studies of women and gender. And I hardly need to remind such an audience that transcendent beings are often represented as men. I would also represent uh, oh, sorry, I would also reference anthropology and music professor Georgina Bourne's point in her brilliant introduction to her edited book, Music, Sound, and Space, about the auditory self being an embodied self that responds and resounds just as it constitutes, quote, a boundary point that impedes or stops the flow of music and sound as well as being potentially initiatory in relation to sound and music, as much agentive and mediating as mediated. Now, a study such as mine could not proceed without that level of ambiguity and fluidity. Before delving into my research process, uh, it behooves us to reflect on why the academic study of religion has been, in Vivian Lee Nitre's words, Quote, such a quiet field of study. 
and why Isaac Weiner, whose recent pioneering book, Religion Out Loud, address, which addresses religious sound, public space, and religious pluralism in the US, is prepared to indict scholars of religion for, quote, disciplinary deafness. Clearly, the history of the field, with its Western European provenance, attendant visualist and rationalist paradigms, and textual and philological roots provides a partial explanation. But we need to ask why studies of religious auditory culture have lagged behind those of visual culture and materiality more generally. A few years ago, I was commissioned to write a piece on auditory materials for the Routledge Handbook on Research Methods in the Study of Religion. In the interest of time, I've listed some of these methodological challenges. I'm not going to read them, but um, I mean, uh, so these are the reasons that I found um, from uh, surveying the literature about you know, what makes it difficult to study sound. You know, it's ephemeral. The sound may be indiscernible or difficult to access. That would very much apply to perhaps studies of women, or it may be too loud. It's easier to see someone looking than see someone listening. And then this is extremely important, especially you know, as I'm trying to be in conversation with sound studies. It's overwhelming in its multidisciplinarity. And you know, deciding on what focus you're going to take I'm trying to make the connections between the production of sound <coughs> as well as the uh, reception and perception of sound, uh, but some studies just do one. Uh, lack of technical expertise, uh, all of that. And then <coughs> the ubiquity of sound, we take it for granted. Um, and it's difficult to write about sound. So in terms of my, oops, sorry, stay there. In terms of my current project, as Adam braided above, I'm working at the intersections of religious studies, sound studies, and the anthropology of sound, and gender studies. My three-legged stool approach would work famously if they all paid more attention to each other. The problem is they don't. So I could have excellent books on religion and gender but there'll be no reference to the sonic or the oral. I could have great books on sound, but they don't say anything about gender or religion. So this is my problem. But So I am knee deep, or actually it's almost up to my head now in my study, going through <laughs> trying to find all the sources to try to synthesize and find what's out there. Now, Georgina Bourne provides an impressive overview of the burgeoning web of disciplinary and interdisciplinary research on sound, space, and technological mediation that informs her latest book. But guess what? Studies of gender and religion are not on that list. But I take some solace from her observation that there are few cross-currents between the various fields of inquiry. In other words, we've not missed the boat. And as Bourne states, bridge building is in order. Jonathan Stern, one of the key figures in sound studies, also gives cause for hope when he says that sound students, that's me, some of you, are usually something else as well, such as anthropologists, historians, philosophers, or engaged in other fields such as media studies, cinema studies, or gender studies. So rightly or wrongly, my response to the above scholarly developments has been to opt for a comparative cross-cultural agenda rather than a specific ethnography such as Anne Rasmussen's important study, Women, the Recited Quran and Islamic Music in Indonesia. At this stage, my content is more historically and empirically oriented with a good measure of problematizing and redescription. It operates on the basis that sound is as culturally constructed, contextualized, and mediated a category as our gender and religion. I also advocate, like Salome Fergolin, that sound needs to be freed from the stranglehold of vision, but agree with Veit Elman that the goal should not be to produce his famous phrase, a counter-monopoly of the ear. Now, we're getting to examples. 
My choice of examples for today is guided by some of the conceptual rubrics or constellations that I'm using for my course and my book. Namely, voices, instruments, listening cultures, soundscapes, and transformations. Since time is limited, I've opted for cases that demonstrate the capacity of sound to decenter gendered religi religious differentiation and that might reorient our understandings of women's religious agency and practice. So please hear them as a sampler mix or appetizers than as a coherent set. In such a wide-ranging study as, it, uh, as this, I'm sure many of you might ask, what makes a sound sacred or spiritual or divine? And what makes it feminine or, fe or female? Or how can a sound be associated with, related to, or deriving from women? Um, in other words, what's grist for my mill? I assure you I cast my net pretty widely to explore these questions by going beyond the Hall of Fame religious traditions to include New Age religion, popular and electronic music, and sound art with spiritual inflections. For example, if fans say that Madonna's rock music created a type of sacred sonic space that resisted patriarchal anxieties about the female body, then that is good enough for me. <laughs> Perhaps we can discuss this more in the Q&A. <laughs> when one studies comparatively the sounds produced, heard, and used by women or associated with women in religious or related contexts, one encounters a full spectrum of responses from demonization to adulation. The voice is an obvious starting point wailing and lamenting. Anne Carson's trenchant piece on the gender of sound bemoans the legacy of Aristotle's postulation that the high-pitched voice of the female is evidence of her evil, as brave creatures such as men and lions have large, deep voices. Yet in an article on gendered nonverbal behavior in ancient Greek ritual, Christina Clark writes, that by nature women were especially suited to voice emotional cries that were valued at the critical moment of mediation between mortals and gods when an animal was sacrificed. This high piercing ritual cry, or ololige, similar to that at childbirth, was believed to be able to attract divine attention. Similarly, the dead were thought to be able to hear the funeral laments of women. So this age-old oral tradition that combines singing and weeping at moments of transition is dominated by women in many cultures, but often occurs in private or communal settings rather than public ritual contexts, and is conse consequently treated as folk and para-liturgical rather than liturgical music. At our Women's Studies and Religion uh, program seminar yesterday, our colleague Anila Dalitsai told us how the war widows in Afghanistan grieved together in active silence, collectively experiencing suffering, as, according to Quranic injunction, the ear is an organ of sympathy. Now, there exists a strong relationship between prayer and song in Judaism, mainly due to music's emotional qualities and capacity to transcend the confines of language. And quote, uh, it's an article from uh, Friedman, to provide a sense of the immediate yet ineffable presence of the sacred. So sincerity, piety, and humility are expected on the part of the cantor or Hazan, who must resist the temptation to perform or entertain. So it's interesting to note that before women were allowed to sing at public <coughs> rituals in the US from the 1970s onwards, some singers had become renowned for their performances of Jewish spiritual music in alternative spaces such as Yiddish American theater from the end of the 19th century. However, 
within Orthodox Jewish communities, there is still the issue of kol isha, the halakhic prohibition on men from listening to a woman's singing voice because of its perceived links to sexual incitement. Some rabbis have declared that it is permissible for a man to hear a recording of a female singer when the singer is not visible to the listener, although this is still being debated. Now, transgress transgressing boundaries is helped by male family members. I mean, you see this in the biographies of these trailblazing female cantors. Cantor Deborah Kachko Zimmerman was trained privately by her cantor father and was the granddaughter of an eminent European cantor. Even though admitted to the profession, she felt isolated and created the network, the Women Cantors Network, in 1981. Maybe we could call that a counter-religious public. At the conference in honor of Professor Kay Chalamet at the Department of Music nearly two weeks ago, I was lucky enough to learn more about women in Jewish music from ethnomusicologist Professor Mark Klickman. One of his more interesting points was that the first women cantors had to modulate their voices to sound more like men, but that that has now changed. This is an interesting comparison to the business world or the professional world where women are supposed to cultivate deeper voices to avoid discrimination. And I found an interesting article uh, recently about how this has resulted in octave compression uh, that women normally sound pitch an, an octave higher, but because of this emphasis on deep voices, it's now only three quarters of an octave. You look skeptical. Um, all right, so let's just hear one of these. Uh, uh, this is uh, Cantor Kim Conrad. It is she, she performs in both the secular and the, the, the sacred spheres. Um, this is not a good video. It was done by a husband. I think that's a good to have to rush. Um, now some of the same restrictions on hearing and seeing women perform in ritual contexts obtain in Islam. But Anne Rasmussen's groundbreaking breaking study of women and Quranic recitation in Indonesia shows that in the world of reciters in the more egalitarian context of Indonesian societies, ideas of women's voices and bodies as being a, a source of shame are openly contested. She describes how women embody, encode, and enact the sound of the recited Quran in ways that transmit knowledge of Islamic text and oral experiences of the divine through female subjectivities. So, you know, this book really could be a role model for other studies in, in other contexts. Now, um, this is quite a big jump here to uh, <laughs> contemporary divas of sacred music um, who I argue provide cogent examples of female agency in the global market of world music. In addition to recordings and publications, they all have useful websites that provide histories, samples, and articulations of their sonic creations. They narrate experiences of marginalization and challenge exclusionary structures and ideas. These technicians of the sacred, whether converts or born into their traditions, have the training, support, and resources to create their own sound worlds. In the case of Diva Pramal, the German mantra singer known for her meditative New Age music, and Sanatam Kaur, the American Indian Sikh songer and songwriter, the sonic aesthetic niche that they have cultivated is feminized and relaxing, 
While in contrast, Abida Parveen, the great Pakistani Sufi singer, in an interview with The Guardian last year, stated unambiguously, I'm not a man or a woman. I'm a vehicle for passion. I'm told by my colleague, uh, colleague Anila that she dresses androgynously too. Her father, who ran a devotional music school, broke with tradition and chose her as his musical heir rather than his two sons because of her vocal talent. The listening publics of these global divas encompass both religious devotees, mainly diasporic, and spiritual seekers. Now, it was an agonizing choice for me which one to choose, but I thought that since you might you know, be a bit stressed out, it's the middle of the day, I went for the most relaxing one. <laughs> um, switch to instruments and many choices but of course I picked drums. Um, women played the earliest frame drums to honor goddesses in ancient times but have only recently reclaimed the practice after centuries, perhaps millennia of exclusion. The main advocate of this movement, Lane Redmond, claims that banning women's drumming from religious life was central to women's disempowerment in Western culture. Whether or not you agree with her matriarchal analysis, there's no disputing her successful appeal to rhythm and primal heritage to generate new forms of religious practice and even community for women in the form of drumming circles. As for the reasons why women don't drum, beyond physical challenges, the big drums, or male control of rhythmic power, I found an interesting explanation from an article by Anna Herfnagels on Ojibwe Indians. Since their social structure is predicated on complementarity and drums are female, gifted from the goddess to men, only the latter could strike them. Furthermore, women have the power of procreativity and don't need drums. When women gain access to musical sounds previously restricted to men, do they change the sounds? Lane Redmond claimed that she had a slower tempo. Dr. Radhika Umdeka modified the veena, the instru instrument associated with Sarasvati, the Hindu goddess of learning, music, arts, wisdom, and nature. She made it lighter and gave it a higher sound. We might also ask as a side note whether female scholars such as ethnomusicologist Catherine Hagedorn, who not only studied Santeria drumming but participated in rituals, how do they, do they bring about change by opening up spaces for women's participation? Just a quickie here. <laughs> Okay, on to listening and hearing. 
Listening is held to be the most passive of the senses, and women are popularly held to be better listeners. But the renowned composer and accordionist Pauline Oliveros, that I was privileged to meet and have do one of her workshops at the Big Ears Festival, uh, developed influential theories surrounding the ideas of deep listening and sonic awareness and the embodiment of sound. She spent her life promoting the work of women in sound. In the program notes for a recent piece titled Listening for Life, Death, Energies, she wrote, Hearing is the first sense organ to develop in the fetus and the last sense organ to shut down after death. I listen backwards and forwards for my life, death, energies. End of quote. In interviews, she's talked about capturing sounds from a nether realm and the influence of Gaia or the earth. Wait a minute. This is it. Without further ado, I would like to... Soundscapes. A considerable portion of sound studies research has been devoted to the concept developed by R. Murray Schaefer of the soundscape or large-scale acoustic environment. Some excellent work has been done on Islamic soundscapes but uh, because of the call to prayer, but it's hard to find studies that address co gender considerations. I did strike lucky recently and found an excellent article by Maureen Jackson on how Ottoman, Turkish, Jewish women navigated a range of musical, religious, and social norms through their multi-ethnic neighborhood. The generative framework of the soundscape allows for an expanded auditory awareness of both the passive and active listening in their lived urban space. It serves to re-theorize gender and Jewish music making beyond the oppositions of male, female, or Hebrew liturgical Ladino folk life cycle music by conceiving more continuous if contentious zones of transmission of musical practice. I want to end with some examples from contemporary ambient or space music and sound art. Electroacoustic music has traditionally been male dominated, but a number of women are increasingly making their mark as technology becomes more accessible. I'm very drawn to this experimentation with sounds, particularly their immersive, transportive, and spatializing effects. I believe the ambiguity of these sonic creations about whether they are spiritual or secular is precisely what attracts their listeners and devotees. And I will confess to being a devotee. Uh, for example, British sound artist Melise sees, oh, I try to keep out all visual metaphors, understands the organic and electronic <laughs> as interactive. She facilitates the sounds of plants that she treats as sentient beings in the algorithmic alchemy of her music. It's not my quote, somebody else's. This recalls the belief of some historians that music began with the desire to imitate sounds in nature. She's also very the proactive about taking <coughs> nature into music space uh, into urban spaces with that bus. Now this is exquisite.
This is the sound of plants growing. Are you hearing it? Can you make it louder? different type of, these are more like sound installations. Uh, Janet Cardiff is a Canadian multimedia artist renowned for her sound walks and sound installations and their capacity to generate oral and visual experiences that purportedly transport the viewer to other realms of consciousness. Her 40-part motet, which is a disassembling and a reassembling per voice, and each voice then comes out of each speaker, of Thomas Tallis's Spem in Allium, has been described as ghostly and transcendent. <clears throat> Sound healers. My final category in the transformations uh, category which I have really not much time to treat, mainly comprises the realm of sound healing or sonic th therapy in which many women play leading roles, whether on the neo-shamanic or the scientific vibro-acoustic end of the spectrum. Some like to combine ancient sound objects, such as Tibetan singing bowls, with the latest voice print technology. There is my own personal sound healer back in Maryville, Tennessee, Dr. Suzanne Jonas, I'm happy to say, is pretty eclectic. Now, I can say more about uh, the, the world of sound healing, the role of women in question time, if you wish. All right, conclusions. There's my question, so now disappearing up the top there. But what might a sonic turn bring to the study of religion and gender? While my project does not explicitly <coughs> foreground feminist advocacy. I sincerely hope that the methods, question, and examples that I've shared may lead to studies of women, gender, and religion that hear better and sound studies that listen in more <laughs> on research on religion and gender. In addition to enhancing or supplementing scholarship, a greater probing of the sonic, the auditory, and the acoustic might contribute the following. And if you don't mind, because I think these are important, I'm going to read them. New understandings of how women are valued or devalued in religious contexts and the dynamics of gender differentiation. Ways of writing history that, sorry about that typo, that more adequately re recognize the sounding and musical activities of women and denaturalize gender stereotypes. Reflections on how sight, sound, noise, and silence have been gendered, and how sound signifies in relation to power and subjugation. An enhancement, enhancement of discourses on women's bodies, embodiment, subjectivity, ways of knowing, and constructions of masculinity and femininity. And perhaps provide another perspective on women's survival and transgressive strategies, whether it's finding alter, alternate, alternative spaces, modification of voices and instruments, appropriation of new technologies through spirit possession or channeling, and then uh, uh, mythological revisionism, that's uh, Lane Redmond, research pub conferences, publications. An awareness of new areas of religious agency and devotional activity for women as listeners, performers, composers, sound artists, and sound healers. And perhaps more nuanced analysis of the sacred and the secular, liturgical, <coughs> non-liturgical, public and private, self and collectivity, male and female binaries. 
And then, as well as providing some new tools and concepts such as soundscape, orality, and audibility to assess the gender dynamics of lived religion. In sum, there is much work to be done if we are to take advantage of what Jean-Paul Thibault calls the heuristic power of sound. End quote. And if we wish to generate new discourses on the imbrications of sound, gender, and religion. So I welcome your feedback today and in the future. Thank you for your attention. Great question, thank you, and Yakir uh, <laughs> um, may perhaps help me out with this, uh, given the example uh, that you uh, gave. Um, I think, uh, as I suggested, I'm probably more historically and empirically oriented, so I'm probably more interested in listening practices um, rather than getting at the more theoretical or phenomenal, from phenomenological aspects of listening. I mean, there's, some, there's a great book uh, that um, uh, Ernst Carroll is using in his class, um, uh, Salome Vogelin's uh, Listening to uh, Sound and Noise. Is that the, the where, where, where's, uh, is that the correct time? Listening to Noise and Sound. Oh, Noise and Sound, that's right. So. Um, that she is really um, uh, sort of a compelling writer about the, um, the the agency of listening. The, it, it's not passive, and you know while she's not really giving very uh, concrete examples, she she really makes you rethink uh, those concepts. So. Um, I mean, this, but you're absolutely right. This would be a very challenging area to research. Uh, it's easier to probably do research on women drumming <laughs> than it is on women listening in um, secluded spaces. So, I mean, the example that I gave from Anila, from her own field research, going into uh, women's homes and being rather surprised that instead of wailing and lamenting, they were actually engaged in what she called active silence. So um, I think uh, we were talking, yes, about the, uh, with the need for more research uh, on these areas, uh, about uh, it, it drawing on some of the insights uh, from people who are really um, focusing on listening. Uh, it's one component of what I do. Uh, but, uh, Yaki, do you want to say anything? Oh, okay. Jacob. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. This is great. I think I now know what you mean by uh, the way you describe yourself as anthropologically in inclined historian of religion. Right. So, thank you for that. Did you like that? Uh, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> 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 uh, it's because uh, behind this, this is great. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> this is lovely. Um, let me, uh, one or two comments and then a question. One, it has to do with the fact that some of these high lenses that you pointed out in why people have not done this and that. Yes. Uh, say, for example, the quiz of the Quran, the fact that women have not been you know, featured in that. It has to do, of course, with the fact that they focus on certain traditions and neglect the other. One, the recitation of the Quran, done by the, you know, uh, other in the, in, the, in, the, in the mosque or even from public uh, uh, gatherings, which are, of course, done by uh, uh, men do not also take into the consideration that women in those mosques, uh, like in West African mosques, have associations 
that come together to praise the, the Quran. I mean, sorry, to praise the Muhammad or to talk about the Quran. Bayala Salat, for example, in Yoruba uh, Islam, and they sort of neglect that. So, uh, however, in uh, uh, the recital of the Quran, particularly the one that makes the call to prayer, is almost performing, performing it. It's holding, you know, at times holding his ears, and then you start wondering, or is he not willing to hear even his own voice as he recites or calls the faithful to prayer? So you find a lot of things that are connected with this sign that you're talking about. So I'm interested in how you're going to filter this thing out. So it doesn't become a book that deals with so many things that are related, but perhaps will become very eclectic to use the word you you know you uh, you you use uh, much earlier. The second part is that I mean this is very comprehensive, and I can see you also doing an introductory book that will be so valuable to students of religion and anthropologists and sociologists who are dealing with not just science itself, ritual. Verbal and all these things that are connected. So I, I'm sort of asking for a clarification. What kind of book do you have in mind? Given, you know, I mean, I, your students are going to enjoy your class next, next spring. There's no doubt about it. I can see that. But in terms of the book, in terms of your insight, what do you have in mind? Thank you. Um, well, there are people here who done research on Islam and soundscapes who could probably answer uh, that <coughs> much better than I can ever, but I mean I would uh, uh, agree that um, Islam uh, presents a particularly rich uh, case study for examining um, <coughs> perhaps some of the uh, <coughs> distinctions between music and sound. Um, uh, and, and, and so, and also the roles of women uh, in seclusion. So there's the very public aspect of Islam creating soundscapes. There's also the more private, uh, the recitation. So it's about so it's about hearing and reciting the Quran. So that explains why there's uh, excellent studies to date uh, in this area, but. I just wanted to, uh, I mean, that's a pretty thin answer for, a, you know, it's a very loaded question, but um, I think that it allows me to say that let's not forget uh, the role of, of modern media technologies. I mean, many of you are familiar with Charles Hershkitt's book on modern Egypt and the use of audio cassettes you know, to, to cr sort of create disciplines of piety. Uh, but women too, I mean, with the, you know, there's so much of this on YouTube now. There's so much, you know, forget cassettes and DVDs. I mean, anybody who's got a smartphone can, can gain access to these sounds, women included. So, I mean, we, uh, you know how fast in Africa the rate of, of ownership of, 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 of smartphones, not just, the, you know, mobile phones is going, I mean, we haven't really begun to consider what's going to be the impact of, of women's access to sounds, that, that it may be even you know, creating their own sounds using these very accessible forms of technology. So number two, it, uh, that's a big question. I mean, this is, please, it's only November the 6th, right? And I've got till um, June the 30th by my calculation. Um, so, um, uh, like a politician, I think I might deflect that question. <laughs> but, um, I, I, no, no, no. But seriously, no. But that is to say that you, you know, you, you, you know me very well. I mean, Jacob and I go back a long time. Uh, he's, 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 he's. No, you, you put your finger on it, and I. But I'm agonizing over it. You know how to best. Um, how, how, be, how best to do this. So, you know, if you have strong ideas about how I should do that, I will listen to you, right? I will listen to you. And, um, yes, so the more discussion, the better. Yes? Thank you for your talk. Um, first, I wanted to celebrate the range of spiritual traditions that were available. Um, and also, 
the fact that it wasn't centered around Christianity. But I also want to challenge that because it seems that there are a number of aesthetic utterances, percussive instruments, and even volume and voice modulation used by women that could possibly um, be added to this discussion. And I just wanted to know uh, what your thoughts were on those. There's a million things that could be added to this discussion. I mean, it, as I said, it's just a sampling, but... Um, so, so just say again what you would like added. I mean, what might make a difference in terms well, of this? I'm just wondering if I missed the Christianity altogether or if it just wasn't. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, uh, well, um, yeah, maybe in one of those uh, slides that I cut, that, that's, that's a good point. No, I mean, I, I probably uh, would have uh, said something about... Um, uh, uh, cathedral music, uh, choral music, um, women, I mean, uh, girls only recently after centuries being admitted into uh, choral performance. Um, you know, why is that? Um, it's also, you know, to do with the nature of, of the voice, but uh, as well as with, um, uh, uh, you know, patterns of, of male domination. Uh, uh, within uh, the, the tradition, um, but I mean, there, there. Uh, I mean, yes. Why didn't I have a slide up of Hildegard von Bingen? Yeah, I mean, uh, but you know, we've been talking about this a lot. Uh, it's like everybody expects Hildegard von Bingen to be up, but I mean, uh, my colleague uh, Alison Moore has been giving me some great examples of how uh, nuns. Um, you know, was, their singing was screened off uh, from public viewing. Uh, but I came across a wonderful story um, in a book on early modern uh, England about constructions of masculinity, um, uh, but where some of the men uh, were so entranced by this this heavenly music, they they. They imagined these absolutely beautiful creatures behind the screen. So they asked, one famous person asked for the screen to be removed, but the nuns played a joke and put a couple of not very attractive women uh, behind the screen. And, and I mean, it, it show, and then so the, 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 the person in question said, oh, you could keep the screen. So they went back to singing behind the screens, at least in this particular instance, and that the, so that the mediation of the screen actually contributed to the imagination. You know, the not seeing the source of the sound, I didn't say anything about acousmatics and, and all of that, um, but that's a fascinating area. I mean, uh, we could say about sound that uh, you know you don't always perceive the source of the sound, and that can have consequences for imagining transcendental or spiritual origins. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. This is absolutely fascinating, Robin. And I know absolutely nothing about this. Uh, this question may come from left field. I'm not even sure I know how to ask it. But it seems to me that there may be a difference in framing the question as what might a sonic term bring to study of, of religion and gender, as opposed to what might a gender term bring to the study of religion and sonics. Because it seems to me that um, the, the introduction of gendered performance changes the nature of the relationship between the sonic and the religious. For example, in, in Southern African context, it opened up certain forms of, of, again, Christianity in this instance, to trance, which wasn't, wasn't even thinkable with, with um, male or uh, male singing at all. Similarly, it seems to me that what does make a difference in the, the term gender here is what kind of gendered performance, because there's a huge difference between focusing on individual singers, different, uh, different forms of, of choral singing, different forms of, um, uh, forms of harmonics that, that require co-gendered presences, etc., etc. So there's a sociology behind the gender term in the relationship between the sonic and the religious. And it varies by, by whether one places the, the, the gender term where sonic is, the sonic term where gender is. No, I mean, uh, <coughs> thank you for, it's always such an um, insightful intervention. Um, 
No, I understand what you're saying. And I, you know, I'm trying to get away from the sort of sociology of, of, of music or the anthropology of music. I mean, I know I've got to go there some, but it's, you know, I really want to focus on sound and its complexity. And so, but I, I will think about that. Uh, maybe some of you can help me to think about that, whether it does make a difference. But I, I certainly can't claim to be doing this for sound studies, right? Sound studies people <laughs> need to do it. Uh, you know, I, uh, Peter McBurry told me that you know, this conversation is going on, is, you know, how to make sound studies more gendered. And Ernst Carroll is interested in religion. So, I mean, it'll happen through conversation. So, but, but that is an interesting point, John. Thank you. Uh, you know, if it weren't at the end of the lecture, I'd probably have a little more, a bit more lucidity to answer you with, but thank you. Yes, Madeline. Yes, I wondered about the question you asked initially, something like the androgynous voice way one can be fascinated listening to a voice and not being able to tell if this is male or female and, and what the implications of that are. Implications, Many right. places in the world where that is so, there's a traditional Japanese way of singing folk songs, for instance, where it's extremely difficult to tell on the radio that you're listening to that song. Mm. That, no, that's a great question. No, I mean, you, you've heard how I'm going back and forth between women and gender. Obviously, I'm not studying women in isolation from gendered uh, structures and, and what have you, ideologies. But I, you know, the, there's so much work to be done on women almost to, to, to be able to take the conversation further. But, but that is a, a, a fabulously interesting question, and I intend to pursue it. And if you can, it should break down gender polarity. Yes, which exactly. Which you're clearly doing in many of your examples. Some so. people would love that. Yes. Hi. Um, this is not a question, but sharing a thought. Uh, uh, to me, uh, God, the, the masculine, is uh, invisible, and uh, when He shows up in a in a good in a godly good way, He shows up as a feminine part. Style. And I've been thinking about this, and I was sitting in church the other day, and listening to the music, church music, a bunch of uh, males and females standing. The male voice, to me, it, it with a bass, it looked like a scream, uh, just a scream which is not moving at all. And the female voices were the ones, as if the scream is fluttering, the lines, if, I, if I, I'm a visual guy, if I paint a curtain, and if I just brush uh, very homogeneous uh, color, it, it will be like the male voice, the bass voice on the backward. But I, I will know that that's a song that they are singing only by the female voice, which, which is shrieky voice, which uh, makes the curtain lines <coughs> flutter. If I make it in a different, explain it in a different way, if there's a still water, I won't know that there's water. If there's ripple, then I know that there's there's water there. So I'm trying to see when I this is just in part I appreciate. It. I don't know how it connects with your time. I, don't, I mean that's interesting, but I, I, I don't know that I could comment, but but uh, but thank you. Um, sure. when you were talking about the ripples on water, I was thinking about the sa sand, you know, the pattern created in sand by sonic vibrations. Um, would women create different patterns in the, in, the, in, the, in the sand? But anyway, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I had these conversations with my former colleague, Jim Isaac Weiner, who's most of you noted. Uh, so I've been having conversations about religious sound mapping specifically. The question I have uh, sort of patterns the question about Gender what, sorry? Gender neutrality. Oh, yes, okay. And the oral in listening, because you started us with a sound and we asked whether we thought it was a female or a male voice. My question sort of flips that. So you mentioned in your response to the question the impact of uh, visual, so YouTube, or um, the ability to you know, carry 
in various mediums sound now. That is not just cassettes that you walk around with, that you have MP3s, you have all of these other options. And so my question asks about authority in the visual and if that changes the orality, the impact of orality. I specifically looking at ways in which women can, as, as they are seen, no longer have to hide for the voice. <coughs> so if you mention producing a lower octave to be seen or to be heard more masculinely, well, you can't really do that if there's a visual <coughs> associated. So does that visual then impact the import of their oral tradition? It's a great question. We, we actually touched on some of this yesterday in our seminar about the, um, what were you calling it, Jennifer, the intersectionality of, the, of sight and sound. Um, so, um, I mean, going by those, some of those, um, the divas, Right, the ones who are really cultivating a market image, um, then certainly they, I imagine they're very uh, critically um, thinking about the connectivity between their image and how they sound. But perhaps in terms of more, um, I mean, if, if you think, um, I was just thinking, going back to uh, uh, choral performance and um, how women uh, are dressed now in <coughs> English cathedrals, you know, how, I mean, they're, they're certainly um, uh, outfits that disguise the body and that probably make them uh, look quite similar to the boys or, or to the men. But I, I, I think that there's definitely an interplay there and, and that's gonna be somewhere, something that I will uh, pursue as an area of inquiry, so thank you. Does anyone have any suggestions in, in relation to that great question? But Sarah, did you have your, yeah? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for this sermon. Very fascinating. I wonder if you could say a little bit more because it comes up every now and then in your presentation um, about silence and the way that silence relates to basically the new perspective that you want to bring, right? Because in, in the field of uh, religion and gender, because clearly silence plays an important role in many religious practices. So I suspect that something has been written about that. And then I know that on intersection of gender and silence, women and silence, having a voice, not having a voice, much has, written, has been written on that as well. But I clearly see that you're trying to do something else, and I wonder how those, that scholarship on silence would get refigured in, in what right. you were doing here. Yes, uh, if I weren't doing this today, I'd have been on the plane to Belgium. Uh, to uh, Louvain because there's a conference tomorrow on gender and silence. Oh, no, I'm <laughs> missing it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, if I shared with you the prospectus for this conference, it would answer your question about exciting new research on gender and silence, not necessarily in relation to religious obedience, but actually uh, a much more uh, active uh, uh, understanding uh, of the, the agency of silence. So, so yes, I mean, I think, um, and also, but I am, uh, plan B is this evening I'm going to MIT because there's a, a discussion between a rabbi um, and a Buddhist monk about silence. So, stay posted. I don't know if they'll <laughs> mention gender. I'll let them go so far that you know, put my hand up. But, uh, but I mean, Madeleine, wouldn't isn't there lots in Alison in medieval on on the ages? Uh, 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 
Francisco on the agency of, of, of silence. But it is really interesting in that case what is silence really, because in the Middle Ages, in, in, in monastic uh, performances, uh, there was a, the concept of sonorous silence. I mean, silence is not the lack of, of right. sound, right. it's something right. else, you know, the, the chanting of the songs. Uh, and that monotonous murmur, that is silence also. So it's interesting starting with the definition of silence. Mm -hmm. And how silence is visualized, actually. I was really interested in this, <coughs> this yeah. image of the, the female voice and like a flickering curtain. Because I've been, uh, I've been looking at the, the representations of, of this apocalyptic passage of silence in heaven, in commentaries of the apocalypse of the Atos of Lievana. It's fascinating how they try to represent silence in heaven, and they come up with these amazing solutions in which sometimes they just put the word silence in kind of acrostic form, almost like falling like a curtain. And like visually, you see it moving. It's quite interesting. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the fascinating thing about it, that silence. Yeah, and I think those that are interested, what well, we do, the theory of, um, uh, uh, of, of electronic music, ambient music. Uh, I mean, ever since John Cage, um, he also have very interesting things to say about the, the spaces. I mean, you've got to have spaces uh, in, 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 um, in, in organizing musical sounds. There have to be spaces, but how, whether those are productive silence but you know how so i think with electronic music and looping and everything like that there's there's more attention to um uh the role of silence you know so yeah peter um thanks this is really exciting to hear and i was curious to sort of think through silence most of the examples you showed i think all of them maybe were things that we could sort of play back and that's part of the, sort of the genre of powerpoint but also i'm curious if you found sounds or examples that are non-performative or things that sort of extend outside of someone singing or someone doing fixed action that sort of easily ends up as a recording. Um, you know, ambient spaces, or you mentioned yeah. ways of speaking. I'm just curious if you have other fragments that kind of fall outside of, even beyond paraliturgy, into spaces of, <coughs> um, I don't know, yes. no, I mean, or you know, you're absolutely right. Stuff. I mean, <laughs> Okay, so I miss Christianity. I miss ambient sounds. Right. I mean, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, 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 um, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I definitely could have. I mean, um, you know, whether it's, it's clapping or, 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 or environmental, or, yes, uh, environmental sounds. I, yeah, I, but it, it's challenging, of course, how do you represent silence, right? Um, but also, Capturing, I, I, but I didn't go looking for oh, looking. I didn't go searching <laughs> uh, for um, for that. But I mean, do, do you? Well, you probably got it from your own research. But I mean, does that exist on YouTube? If if I typed in sort of ambient environmental noise with religious connections, <laughs> <laughs> might take more than YouTube. I mean, there are artists like Anil Offer to work with the environment and sort of gender in some way, maybe not religiously, but I was really just purely curious because yeah. it, it is, I think, the hardest thing to find, but in some ways then it seems like it upends what we think we know sound to be. And yeah. so it seems like it's maybe right. Well, well I made the point at the beginning, so at least mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, you know, I can claim some credit for that. No, but <laughs> it's, it's a great point. <laughs> yes, it is a so um, can we maybe take all the remaining questions um, very quickly because we have about three or four minutes left. Uh, so perhaps you won't respond to each one, but just find out what people are thinking about. Okay, so Sorry. very briefly, and I would love to speak with you further about this, but um, in the sense of sound as a form of vitality and commanding and surrendering to energetic flows and stuff, I thought it would be really interesting to look specifically at the ways in which these things were um, historically and across the globe policed and, and governed and regulated across gender lines. So for example, there, there are widespread beliefs that women can perceive higher frequencies of sound than men. And then there are also widespread beliefs that women can detect the sort of, um, in normal senses, super, sen super uh, sensible 
sound. So when you have, say, dissonant harmonics or dissonant notes played at the same time, that can produce a sensation that can be sensed um, in what oftentimes people call a sixth sense or something, but that cannot be heard with the ears, and that is said to be able to transform consciousness, to expand one's um, energy field outward, and things like this. And then one other example that I thought of would be um, the ways in which this is heavily regulated across the world, too, how people, and oftentimes people think especially women can do this, have esoteric ways of commanding, um, okay, really quick. No, 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 I mean, the, <laughs> you could speak to that, couldn't you? Yeah, esoteric <laughs> ways of, of, of commanding, uh, commanding sound waves within their mind's eye as forms of some sort of other manifestation of energy, and then transforming it somehow, and redeploying it outward, sometimes using symbols, but other, otherwise just sometimes visualizing it in the mind's eye. And oftentimes women are seen to be able to have a higher access to this, partly because of the wider range of perceptive faculties that they're believed to have had, or to have. So I thought those were just a couple of examples of things that we learned. Great, right. thank you. To, to kind of come full circle with this question of inter intersectionality and to go back to the possibility of isolating uh, sound, there is there's a way that it, it offers us a genderlessness, even if it's, uh, regardless of what, what oct octave it's in, it's, it's still, uh, there, there is still this possibility of genderlessness. And so a, a question that emerges is how do you gender sound without reinscribing some of the essentialist treatments of gender, and and so and, 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 and so how do we define women or uh, what what women signify with respect to this? Thank you. That's it. Okay. Um, well, uh, the <laughs> it, it's a great question about sound and energy and visualization. Um, uh, having a conversation with um, Josh here uh, last night about that, he, he informed me uh, about this woman, uh, Emily Conrad. Conrad. I looked her up last night, and uh, phenomenal. And she, would you say she's doing, or she did some of that, right? Yeah. Um, sort of exploring mystical energies and flows and through performance. Perhaps not so much about the mind's eye, but but so but I love the question. Thank you. And um, yes, uh, uh, Jennifer, this is <laughs> um, a terrific point. Uh, how not to reinscribe or reimpose dichotomies and polarities uh, innocently or otherwise in in doing this, sort of wanting to put the emphasis on women so that we could catch up, you know. So as I said uh, to the group yesterday, I mean, it, it's, you remember back in the days, well, we remember back in the days when it was about, add women and stir, right? Um, <laughs> and then, and then uh, <laughs> we have expert, and, and uh, so we got beyond that, and then, and then there was the phase of uh, visual cultural materiality, like the study of religion. Oh, we forgot to look at paintings, and we forgot to look at perform. You know, so because it was so doctrinal, so textually oriented. So there was that period of let's add images, let's add all of this. So now we're in the phase of, of now we need to add sound and stir, and, 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 and given that we're at an advanced stage in, in thinking about gender compared to what we were back then, I hope that I can be um, uh, informed and helped by your research and your ideas as I certainly have been today. But I'll need more help, so uh, please stay tuned. Thank you very much.